Hi, everybody. Um, uh, my name is River Lin. I'm a performance artist and the curator of Asia Discovers Asia meeting for contemporary performance, Adam. And Adam, uh, uh, since 2017, uh, it has been initially facilitating artists um, from different backgrounds and um, practices uh, from across the Asia Pacific uh, region and beyond to exchange and to do collective research, uh, inventing uh, new collaborative projects in Taipei. And since last year, because of the pandemic situation, uh, we have sort of transformed the gathering programs onto internet settings. And this year, we continue this online gathering. However, we disseminate the program structure. So last year, every year, um, Adam's program is um, basically held in August. However, this year we are doing these online programs for three seasons in April, August, and December. So throughout this long run section, uh, we hope to continue continuously engage with um, arts lovers, practitioners, artists, curators, producers, um, cultural workers, and researchers and curators online to share and also continuously learn from each other. And uh, the inaugural um, online program in April, uh, I have been very honored to be able to invite the performance art diva, Melati Soridamo um, from Indonesia to, <laughs> to um, generously provide us a very thought provoking um, program. And this program is entitled Back to Rituals, uh, Duration, Bodies, and Performativity. In this program, Melotti has been proposing um, a series of um, um, talks, workshop, conversations um, contributed by uh, a list of amazing artists from Europe, America, and Asia to together rethink about um, how and how our contemporary lives in the context of the pandemic, the human, the natural, the ecological will be evolving in the future, particularly uh, looking at the transformation of performance art slash live art today. And so I will pass my microphone to uh, our amazing host, Melati, to introduce further about the program today and to welcome the artist today, Natasha Kompain. Thank you, River. Thank you so much. Thank you for getting me uh, into your program to the Adam. This one is the edition fifth, right? Uh, and uh, yeah, good morning, good afternoon, good evening to you wherever you are now. Uh, I am Malati Suryadamo, virtually meeting you now from my studio, uh, Studio Pasungan in Solo, Indonesia. Uh, I would like to welcome you all to our second day series of talk this week, uh, which is entitled Back to Rituals and focusing on duration, bodies, and performativity. During this pandemic, of course, we are all on the same page. Artists in general are facing the situation that globally impacted by the COVID-19. There have been uncertainty of plan, schedules, restricted mobilities, delayed rhythm of productions, and so on. Nevertheless, in our creative genre, we seek for many possibilities to adjust with and to overcome this condition by keeping our pace and senses in our life. However, digitalization and technology give the possibility for us to meet and connect in many ways. As for example, what we are doing now uh, in this session. As an artist whose practice is using the body as the main medium and who has been dealing with the philosophy of rituals, traditions, psychology, and history of mankind, I was very intrigued to have a conversation, some sharing moments, and further discussions on how the rituals encompass our art practice today. At this opportunity, I am inviting my friends and colleagues in performance art practice. Uh, they are Dr. Diane Butler. Yesterday we had uh, the session with her, which was very 
interesting. We went through valleys, architecture, and of course, have practice and her um, knowledge on spiritual and ritual. And then today we have Natasha Tonte, one of my younger fellows, <laughs> and whose work uh, for me is very provoking. And then tomorrow we're going to have Porakrit Arunanon Chai from Bangkok. And Friday we will have Meg Stewart from Berlin and the States. And also on Saturday, River will uh, host me uh, to have a conversation with him. These artists' uh, practices I consider are embodying the elements of ritual, spirituality, memory, psyche, and determine time and space. I'm hoping we will be able to broaden our perspective and in seeing and relating our spirit of creation through this entangled sharing series by listening and making dialogues with them. Is rituals considered a set of actions and activities involving gestures, language, and objects that happen in a specific space to engage with the influence of spirituality? How do we get inspired by them to our contemporary life? In what means can we connect rituals with the history of our culture and our social environment now? In today's session, which focuses on the body and ritual in digital setting, we have Natasha Tonte as our guest. Welcome, Natasha Tonte. Thank you, Ibu Haraipu. Normally, we, I used to call her Tonte, but now she wants to have her... Tonte is her family name, so better uh, we call her Natasha. <laughs> I prefer to call her Gabi. <laughs> but, but yeah, so, I back in 2014 or 2015, yeah, uh, for the first time. And then um, in 2017, uh, I was very provoked by her performance, which was entitled Makan Mayit. It is translated to be eating the dead, right? <laughs> Natasha, it was a performative dinner with limited guests using a set of, you know, like a informal dinner with lights and, and uh, all the properties and so on, uh, using jelly and milk in the form, in the color of blood and in the form of a dead baby as dessert and surrounded by the images she created. I think she was collaborating with Baku Dapan, is that true? Was it oh, Elia, Elia was helping me on Dramaturg. Elia Nurfista. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And the work became a scandal and raised up to critics from the public and from mothers and, you know, like, and police and all the stories. I was not invited by the organizer for the dinner but I've heard from my friends who were invited. <laughs> I was very, hmm, I'm not invited. But then uh, um, I saw the documentation and it was, I thought it was okay. It was very provoking and very interesting. This young artist I want to meet <laughs> more. So Natasha Tonte, meanwhile, she's an artist and designer uh, based in Yogyakarta, interested in exploring the concept of fiction as a method of speculative thinking. Through her artist, artistic practice, she investigates how fear, horror, and terror could be manifested to control the public. been shown in the National Night Festival 16, Garnetto Bazaar 15, uh, and the Instrument Builders Project in Kyoto Art Center. She recently held a solo exhibition. Oh, she was already, yeah? Or, no, yeah. She also uh, had the solo, some solo exhibition and one of them in Chamati Art House in Jakarta. For today, we will have around 45 to an hour sharing and presentations of Natasha about her works and process. And um, just relax, be relaxed <laughs> and attend uh, what she's telling and sharing. I have reviewed some of her work before, of course, uh, to prepare this session, and I found super 
interesting, especially her cockroach work and her uh, the last uh, where she made the roots in Minahasa. Minahasa is uh, the area of the North Sulawesi. Sea. And uh, yeah, and then later I would like to do a small conversation with her and I will open for a Q&A for you. Um, so maybe we just do it relax and later for the Q&A, you just can raise your, up your hand or um, click the hand raising up or um, write your questions on the chat. Sometimes it's confusing to write questions on the chat, but I would like to have, you know, like open public for raising hand, like, like as if we were in a live conversation or discussion. Okay. Uh, welcome, Natasha. It's your time. Thank you. Um, maybe I should start to share my screen. Um, so, Tabea uh, Patuari Waya, Tamber Laker Minei Mewaliwali Onike Wengini In. Uh, good afternoon, everyone in here in cyberspace. Uh, thank you for joining this session. Um, my name is Natasha Tontai. I'm an artist living and working in Yogyakarta, Indonesia. Uh, apologize if there will be any glitches and spices since we are in the World Wide Web. Um, I would like to thank uh, Ibu Melati Suryo Darmo, also a river and um, Lin Wei for having me on Adam 2021 online program. I am Stoke and Gobsmack to be here again. And we I will be, be sharing a bit of my artistic practice on uh, body and ritual in digital settings. So first of all, I would like to acknowledge the ancestries of Tau Minahasa, Karema, Lumimuut, and Toar, people of the Malasung land, as well as to the elders whom we call Opo from the past, the present, and the future of Malasung land. The indigenous sovereignty has of paying respect to the ancestors between human and non-human has been deemed as something unusual. Modern society sees this phenomena as irrational and alienated by modern religion. It is my privilege and pleasure to tamper with the historical and mythical account of Minahasa. However, I feel an apology is due to the people who have lived during the colonial era in Minahasa. So although my recent works observe a different kind of issues and problems, the method I use is a continuation of a method that I've been using in my previous work. Thus, I will want to share a bit on how I develop an idea. Over the last few years, I have been uh, focusing my artistic practice to explore the theme of fiction, the fictional account of the history and myths surrounding manufactured fear as a method of speculative fiction and how they have determined our expectation for the future. My works have always been site specific intervention where I respond to space as a mode of presentation. This applies not only to physical spaces, but also digital spaces such as the internet. Playing with digital space is a feature that I always apply to my body of work as a characteristic. My aim is to always to question the boundaries between fiction and reality. Through my practice, I am curiously observing any possibility of other future that are projected not from the perspective of major and established institution, 
but a subtle and personal struggle of the outcasted entities and beings. Quite often, major institutions like nation state or religious organization fabricate what we understand as fear. Furthermore, my words mostly start from the response I have to the marginalized life, be it organic or inorganic matter around me, which sometimes forgotten or even overlooked by humans. From the notion of cockroaches and their agency to the forgotten history of Minaha sandstone culture. So Minahasa is an ethnic group that is located in the northern part of Indonesia in Sulawesi Island. It's quite far from where I, where I live now. Uh, I am now in the southern part of Indonesia. I try to raise and observe this phenomena in my work as a response to the world I live in. This works also question the condition of the world in which currently humans are at the center of everything. Can we think outside that framework? The manifesto of tactile and fanciful tactics on how to build a speculative future through 1.0 list of an alternative and plausible cosmic solution. So this is how it started. Um, this is so of tactile and fanciful tactics on how to build a speculative future that I wrote during 2017 until 2018 where I realized humans are not the center of the universe. That this manifesto was presented at Gemetti Institute for Art and Society uh, as in uh, 2018 for my solo exhibition and in 2019 as a lecture performance at Art Jog 2019. Uh, the manifesto became a starting point for the next project, also the Minahasa research. After the cockroach, uh, sorry, after the manifesto, uh, that I um, I began to speculate the future through the agency of cockroaches. If we reflect on today's conditions, the human is still considered subject, or in other words, the center of the ecosystem. However, through this project, Pass to Power, I am proposing a fiction or maybe some kind of thought provoking practice, which the notion of humans is revisit using the agency of cockroaches. Uh, this is the website project of Pass to Power uh, when I had a web residency. Uh, two years ago, pre or pandemic, um, in Academy in Shlo Solitude. In Sisters, brothers, sons, and daughters, it is my great honor and privilege on this historic day to bid you welcome to this world. On behalf of the Society of Cockroach, your hosts, I beg your understanding and forbearance if some circumstances in the universe do not meet your expectation. We've been living for such a long time. Nowadays, we only see dodo birds and humans poke callus in the wonderland, dinosaurs in the big dark room they call cinema. We are small, we can only see the better outsider, unlike the other generations of us. We have, I assure you, done our best to make your stay amongst us memorable for both our guests. So I offer an idea. What kind of knowledge can human generate from cockroach world building and its historicity? How do we build a sustainable future for multi-species interaction? Here I attempt to see the cockroach as a case study, turning what is considered a past into a powerful knowledge in the form of novel approach to science fictioning. 
less science, more fiction, I reckon. So fiction for me is a platform to narrate the story and findings, as well as a method to project my speculation. Through fictional approach, I can practice world building. And for me, um, superstitions, ghosts, and other things that I consider as supernatural. Beings have something in common with art. Art is filled with various kinds of myths, material or immaterial, and objects at the same time. The idea behind the concept of similarity between art and supernatural that is something that I keen to dissect and explore. As fear that I am always confronted with, art is not only subjective and mysterious, but also something that is spiritual. Um, so in the past few years, I tried to revisit uh, Minahasan cosmology and how it adjusted in the contemporary society of Minahasa in North Sulawesi. I began to dig my ancestral cosmology of Minahasan and their relation to the geo entity stone. In Minahasa cosmology, there are almost no boundaries between life and non-life. Uh, in this uh, slide, uh, uh, the video in the back is uh, were taken back in January 2021, where I went for Lumales or Pilgrim to the one of the oldest megalithic sites in Minahasa. The big stone, uh, this uh, the big stone is uh, Watutiwa, the stone of Minahasan first uh, descendant, and the other one is Lesung, an ancient. This is Lesung, so this is ancient mortar, and Malasung is the ancient name of Minahasa, and Lesung is one of the early paraphernalia of Minahasan ancestor. And this one is a friend of mine. Uh, he's here now, uh, Tabea Tonas Andre. <laughs> um, he was praying, Tabea, Tabea. <laughs> uh, praying to the ancestor who is guarding the site, and we were about to start receive message from the ancestors whilst doing Lumales. And this screenshot is one of my fictional writing that is started from Minahasan cosmology. The dynamic of Minahasan cosmology is explored alongside its potential to imagine an alternative world where the phenomena of anthropocentrism practically do not exist through the perspective of contemporary digital culture. But the question for me, to myself, is how to unlearn and learn the customary belief or uh, without seeing it as an exotic subject, but more critical towards my indigenous knowledge. <laughs> Tu batu itu kan simbol kemandian. Ini dari cara pandang juga, karena pemahamannya kan tu tu batu itu bersifat tetap karena dia keras. Tapi batu itu kan hidup, karena batu itu menjadi sumber hidup dari tanaman-tanaman pelopo seperti lumu. Dia juga bersifat melindungi. Siapa yang batal rapi batu kan gue udah bodoh <laughs> There was a short uh, a snippet from my video work, The Apple of Mapalusi. Uh, in the video, uh, there's a voice of Freddy Wawar. He's also here. Uh, he's, 
uh, Minahasan Poet in Tumatombo, based in Sonder. Um, so I start to assemble my research on Minahasan cosmology as a form of digital folklore in which the indigenous knowledge is shared and multiplied through variation of virtual spaces and networks. Something that uh, people in Minahasa also implemented. For example, uh, there's a smartphone movement uh, in Minahasa runs uh, by Calvin Wuisan and videos on YouTube or TikTok of ritual practices. I see this observation similar to the ethnographic work of digital culture and ritual. research on uh, my ancestral roots in Tanah Minahasa, I found that the presence of digital in ancient ritual is applicable. It occurred that to me that Minahasan philosophy gives me an alternative to think speculatively about the other world I want to imagine. Himas 2020 ini kami meminta dan mendesak negara untuk segera mensahkan rancangan undang-undang masyarakat adat jika negara Republik Indonesia ingin umum panjang. So the intersection between digital culture and cultural roots informs my speculation on Mapalus. Um, Mapalus is a mutual aid system in Minahasa. The epoch of Mapalusin is a speculative geologic epoch, an image representation to, ima uh, to imagine a less destructive geological period. And Mapalusin is the era of doing work together on human and non-human community skills, a geological force that is based and developed on mutual interaction and solidarity amongst earth inhabitants directly influenced by Minahasan cosmology and philosophy. As the notions of Anthropocene, Capitalocene, Cthulhucene, Plantiationocene have been distributed, circulated, and discussed, I propose we attempt to reconfigure this terminology. How to configure a novel epochal term, one that has a more positive approach. I speculate this approach may be derived from a monumental shift based on mutual aid and solidarity between species, not seeing others as a resource for extractions. For example, Minahasan relationship with human and nature, an era of transactional activity that is based on care and compassion, not a capitalist accumulation. 
an epochal transition that wrestles against the injustice of our small friend in the ecosystem, like cockroaches to the injustice that stone has been facing for thousand years. Um, a, a utopia non-Darwinian world in which its state equilibrium is constructed from the mutual understanding of its inhabitants. What would the world look and feel if we apply this imaginative geological period? In this imaginative and alternative geologic timescale, all transactions between the earthlings and uh, humans, I mean, just earthlings, will be established from the notion of gift economy. Commodity, in this case, material and labor will be distributed collectively with peer-to-peer -peer system. By doing this, no one extracts nor exploits another. No one masters another. This is what I see when people of Minahasa, who is still practicing ancestral belief, they do mapalus on daily basis for living and saving the cultural site that has been demolished by irresponsible people. Once I had gotten really into Minahasan cosmology, I found that their story is not heteronormative or Darwinian survival at the fittest at all. Uh, like in the uh, beginning, uh, I was shown uh, a picture of ancient mortar or lasso uh, that is not uh, masculine at all. This evidence is how they treated the stone. At the same time, since Minahasan people also experience with colonial presence, many of their cosmological ideas are intermixed with practices of modernity. In this video, uh, this is a part of my film, Wa'ana Wituwatu, or uh, The Children of the Stones, where uh, Opo Karema, uh, our first ancestor, um, knocking the stones and turns a child, Lumimu. <laughs> <coughs> According to the popular myth that has so many, many versions, the first person in Minahasa was Opo Karema, a goddess who gave birth through a stone to her daughter Lumimu'ut. At the request of Karema for descendants, Lumimu'ut partook a ceremony becoming pregnant, eventually giving birth to a baby boy named To'ar. So this is my version of To'ar and Lumimu'ut. Lumimut and Toa. I see that uh, the ritual is still practiced in our contemporary times as an attempt to reclaim the existence of being or becoming To Minahasa. To means people or orang. And uh, however, in a split second, uh, digital media occurs a challenge as well as new world for the ideas of becoming Tau Minahasa is expanded. Practicing Minahasan philosophy in daily life nowadays is also practicing being human in contemporary time in which we see the world through the intersection of screen-based reality as well as the political reality that we are facing every day.
So the video behind is Waruga Tombstone or Menhir or Sarcophagi Complex in Kumalembuai, Tonsea, Air Madidi, uh, one of the area in Minahasa. And this video uh, in the iPhone um, I got from TikTok is a documentation of modern wedding mix and lead by Kawasaran Priest that I presume as uh, Tonaas. They were talking in Tombulu language, if I'm not mistaken, correct me if I'm wrong, sorry. In addition, for centuries uh, in Minahasa culture, technological apparatus for ritualistic purposes and healing process has been their epistemological attempt to maintain the equilibrium amongst human and non-human kin. For example, the usage of uh, astronomical tools. This is the theme of Minahasan uh, lunar calendar. Well, I'm still learning on how the lunar calendar works in Minahasa, and it might take a long time to learn. Uh, there are also bad and good days that I still uh, learning. Uh, maybe the bad and good days uh, is similar to Watan in Japanese. To end my presentations, I would like to share my recent experience in Minahasa that has been bogging up my mind. So here are some pictures. Uh, the left one is taken on one of my field research in while I'm participating a full moon ritual uh, or mahtambulan uh, with komunitas Taumu Umwaya um, and Tona Asjain Tarore. And the middle picture is my experience during childhood. It's taken 20 years apart, where I spent my Christmas Eve paying respect to my great grandfather's tomb in Tondano or Tolour with my mom and brother. A mo uh, this is um, a modern kind of lumales that is already mixed with religion because it happens on Christmas Eve. And the right one is Lumales to my great, 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 great grandfather, Opo Sarapung Stone, uh, said uh, back in the days uh, before people know uh, Tombstone or Waruga, uh, they are, uh, people knew that they are dying and they will prepare uh, their stone. And um, this ritual uh, of Mahtambulan I, that I observe um, during the Ator session. So Mahtambulan is a um, full moon uh, ritual, a ritual that generates um, a phenomenon named Pakampetan, where a state of oneness between human and the earth is achieved through the ancestral conversation mediates by Tonaas, a traditional religious leader or mediator or indigenous intellectuals or just intellectuals. In some Ba'ato ritual, I found myself communicating with ancestral spirits, whom we call Ap Opo or Apo. There are some differences in pronunciation uh, in parts of Minahasa, since there are nine Opo or elders who participate in early ritual of Panu Watu Pinawetengan Pak. Uh, what I found interesting in some rituals, I encountered a moment where myself communicating with uh, my ancestor through mediation by Tonaas. Tonaas mostly. Uh, it's a customary title that is mostly male dominated in this current state. Mm. 
sama setara saudara nah, ada tuh satu mau lebih sebelah orang yang dia membawa ya jangan sok laki-laki kita ya mesti ingat nanti nanti hakikat itu Departing from a curiosity to investigate the femininity in ritualism in Minahasa, I try to record and reflect of one of the Ba'atar in Mahtambulan sessions. I participate with female tonaas as a medium. I did this to experience a ritual in which the medium was a woman. The conversation with my ancestors, regardless of the gender, of the medium turned out filled with conversation about womanhood and the heteronormative in domestic sphere. I tried to reconfigure and build a reflective dialogue and on an ancient ritual practice that has been carried out for centuries and its interaction with contemporary worldviews. If the first humans in Minahasa cosmology was a woman called Opo, why do the rituals carried out in the 21st century still consider the role of women as navigator in domestic space? What if I can do the ritual without the medium? Will the ancestral spirits give the same advice for me to change my appearance to be more feminine to be to have long hair try to wear a skirt or something like that could it be that this ancestral advice of my womanhood is a sample of com complex contemporary minahasan cosmology that is interlinked with the cultural trajectory of ideology in Minahasa from colonialism, monotheism, nation state, and capitalism. This I found really interesting. The entanglement between the ancestor knowledge and modernity and femininity that is embedded in this kind of ritualistic practice. For example, there are lots of questions related to heteronormativity such as marriage, motherhood, hairstyle, just like in the previous video. I wonder if we can think speculatively that this question wouldn't exist and the medium just ask questions that are not coming from heteronormative perspective. This is something I found really interesting, entanglement between ancestor knowledge modernity and femininity and i'm questioning the potential value what has been embodied by mediator or tonas could be more neutral if humans are inscribed with values and cultural baggage is it possible for technology to be more neutral in this case about technology as a medium or mediator for ritual practice speculating the digital potential of relationship with my ancestor. Uh, this picture is an example of Mapalus uh, practices in various kind of way. The big stone behind is uh, Mapalus between human and non-human in Watupina Wetengan. We always celebrate this every 3 January or 
um, depends on the purpose uh, and this is uh, friends make a YouTube about uh, Mapalus and Watu Panimbe or in Mina Wanua uh, Tolour and this is like a image of a contemporary culture how Mapalus works uh, and updates uh, from Tona Asrinto So, Tamer Laker, thank you so much, Iyayat Usanti. Thank you, thank you so much, wow. Oh, that was a uh, very, what do you say, a uh, fulfilling presentation, I would say, uh, to my curiosity. Uh, until today, what have you been doing, Natasha? <laughs> so, and in your in your thoughts, in your idea, and all the you know how you deal with the digital media, uh, I think I think it's um, in very inspiring for our um, time now, where we are now. As if we are, we feel very close with the digital world. But how do we deal actually with the digital language? So there is a language that, uh, for example, in even my generation need to learn. Of course, uh, I know some senior digital artists I very admire, like Kito Steyer, for example, who combines uh, digital medium and, and uh, knowledge and and science, which I thought it was like amazing for the 90s. <laughs> and, and now even more advanced, like more, there are more and more uh, younger artists who are evoking the, the language of digital media. Um, <clears throat> and um, I also thought that um, one thing that I'm very curious of is um, when you do the research, uh, when you went to uh, your great great grandparents' land, your aunt to visit your ancestors' land, and um, how do you feel like uh, how you deal with with the local um, environment? Um. Because I'm, I mean, you know, I'm also an artist, so I'm not an academical uh, or curator in the sense of, you know, more with the knowledge of uh, history of art. But I'm, I'm approaching uh, you as artist colleagues, and we share some experience, probably similar experience. Like when I was away from Indonesia uh, for more than 20 years, and then when I came back. Uh, gradually to Indonesia to revisit actually based on the, the questions of identity uh, in relation with culture and then I grew and developed also the relationship with spirituality with um, with the, all the cosmological uh, knowledge uh, from Javanese culture from uh, Bugis culture um, but I I always have a feeling like, oh, am I uh, like carrying my uh, Western you know, background of education or structure of thinking and revisiting or visiting like an object or is it part of me? So then, honestly, for me, I was criticizing myself a lot. Like, um, okay, Malati, you, you are like a tourist <laughs> looking at your own culture with distance. And so I was very ashamed and uh, very embarrassed about that. So I tried to learn again how to put myself, to put my body and my life into this um, original context where I come from. 
you know. So I'm, um, but the, the detachment process, uh, the distance was actually the important part for me. So that I, without the distance, I may be not so much interested in the context of identity, especially which is related with the culture. But since I'm uh, away, then I ask myself, who am I? Because I was in the position of the other, the otherness for many years. And so uh, when I came back, no, I'm not the other anymore. Yeah. So I'm, you know, like this belongs to me. This is what I am and how I am going up with, you know, that is all safe in, in the body, in my life, uh, directly or indirectly. So how, would, how do you experience this, for example? how? How do you experience um, your being, Natasha Gabriela Tomte, and uh, the relationship with, with the society in Minahasa? Very simple questions, I think. None, none of, of those uh, science uh, related, but it's your very personal feeling or experience that, that you feel. I think it's, um, I'm going to answer with a very personal perspective because I, uh, my mother is still practicing uh, Minas and philosophy. Uh, even she's living in Jakarta. But I always said that, uh, what are you doing? Like, uh, don't call me Anna, my name is not Ngana. Ngana means you in uh, Bahasa Melayu Manado. So mm -hmm. I always mad at her because she always tell me to do this and that. And um, I I thought like, why, are, why do you have so many uh, Minahasan friends? Uh, and why you always speak Manadonis to me? Like, and I, um, I blame her. And um, but I realized that it's also part of her uh, identity. And what her, she's been doing is a is a great work. Even though we have different kind of political perspective, even in Mapalus or in in a customary belief. We have really different view, and um, I how can I say? I so maybe if I go to Minahasa, not so many uh, family will accept me to be there uh, because. Uh, before I try to learn about um, Minahasan culture, people, uh, families in Minahasa, most of them uh, see me as a heresy. I, uh, I'm a satanic person. Those kind of things. They have the belief that I that I'm a bad person because I'm I don't go to church and. The people who accept me to coming to Minahasa is my mother's friends, and um, uh, I remember um, always if in a family gathering in uh, in Jakarta or in uh, Minahasa. People would say uh, going to Watu Pinawetengan. Uh, means that you are uh, worshiping uh, non-God. You are not practicing um, the normal way of a decent human being. And because of, they always said that uh, um, going for uh, Sorry, going to the uh, the stones, uh, you are practicing heresy. 
and um, I tried to, as they are forbid me to go to the ancient site. I try, uh, the, my, then my curiosity grows. And um, I see like in uh, 2015, I went there uh, uh, to join my and um, I didn't see uh, Mapalus at the first time, but um, I I was encountered my very first spiritual moment in Batu Pinabetengan, uh, where the Tona as asked me to. Uh, to to touch the stone, but they were saying in uh, indigenous language, which I don't understand at that time, uh, and just that. And a few years later, uh, after uh, working with uh, speculating the future uh, from almanac, human and human and cockroach, and I began to. Uh, focus on uh, stones and I began to work uh, with uh, and I'm making friends in Minahasa and work uh, closely with them and I think engaging with Minahasa and cosmology made me realize that Th there are many ways uh, of thinking about life that are worlds apart from anthropocentric modernity we have today. That I used to see Minasa it uh, what are you doing like those kind of things, but then I see it more like the existence of stone in Minasa cosmology. It's not for the sake of human extraction or material used by humans to develop technology, but it's an object that gives life itself. And um, um, uh, fortunately, I made uh, uh, friends with a community in Mawale, and um, they helped me to do my research and sharing and. Uh, there is a philosophy in Minahasa, uh, means baku baking pande, and means uh, sh knowledge sharing. So I think perhaps that's the short answer from the. Thank you. I, I was thinking, you know, like because. Uh, Actually, in many uh, native cultures, I would say, or ancient cultures, or our still traditional culture today, mm -hmm. um, all the practice, the ritual practice, and the belief system that we are practicing is still very close, even if we claim that uh, we are living in a very uh, modern time and in the area, area of globalization. And so I was thinking, um, in, in making your work, uh, I was in work uh, that that is a, there is very uh, um, thin border between information, fantasy, fictions, uh, loaded with uh, information of um, tradition and practices semi-documentary, experimental documentary influence also in the in, in the film and um, also the object. I think you will create also the object, yeah, from from the Lumimu'ut and yeah. Tora. So like you, uh, a real sculpture of it, did you? Yeah. I think it was exhibited in Transmediala, Transmediale, isn't it? Was it? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. So, um, in terms of 
creating the the whole image, the whole. Pancingan itu apa ya? Pancingan maaf ya. Impulse. I would say impulse. Yeah, for us to uh, as the audience to to think and to enter your world or the world of Minahasa according to your door of perception. And um, how? There are so many things that, that you have offered there. And how, how um, do you project this uh, more? Is it more like uh, uh, art not piece that open up, that opens up our mind into uh, like more curiosity to our own uh, reflections on our ancestors? Or uh, you are opening an information about Nina? in your way and two different things I think like um, like I would say when I watch I am very fascinated I want to go I want to see Tonas Freddy <laughs> I want to meet I met him only uh, on online virtually in one of the seminar I already attended several months ago but I really want to go there I really want to know I want to feel the spirit I want to feel the, the situation, the environment. It's like, um, yeah, it's kind of an impasse rather than, okay, like remember my Javanese culture, mm -hmm. what happens in Java, you know? And so there is a perspective of, um, how do you say, offering a space for, for a new space that like maybe most of you in who participate in this talk have been to Minahasa yet and from now what uh, Natasha is offering through her work then you are also probably curious wow nice costume of the dance wow stone uh, like like the you know like it's fascinating it's, a new, it's not a new knowledge it's how uh, Natasha is um, delivering the information uh, through her artistic way. What is for you more important? To deliver the inspirations of a new knowledge or a new form like projected more in the future, like for your generation? Um, to think digitally about the myth and to connect our uh, with our ancestors through the language of digital and uh, digital media and and uh, still like, hey, we have a uh, non-human, human, human relations. We have the triangle functions between human nature and the God. And uh, there are spirits that are still existing in our cultural environment and belief. Or uh, rather to reflect back to the, the practice that is more Rao, I would say, um, more the, that, that, you know, like, um, you, know, you understand what I mean? <laughs> I'm Natasha, I called on that. <laughs> Natasha, yeah, what, what is your priority? I mean, like, what is your the biggest desire? Thank you, Bumalati. Such a very interesting question. So uh, maybe I'm going to answer in a, a bit fragmented way. So myth, speculation, and fear, uh, and rituals is uh, recurring themes in my work. Uh, I what I wanted to manifest is like I wanted to initially I wanted to. Uh, develop uh, work based on uh, my experience in Watu Pinawetengan. Uh, this story. <laughs> but um, about how humans build connection with human entities. Uh, but as I reflected on the agreement based on the stone, I found it's more than just human and non-human relation. 
uh, the stone determines a uh, Minahasan practice uh, of commoning the land. No one talks about this importance. I I also wanted to research about my ancestral knowledge that I have been known since I was a child, but I never paid attention to it. And in order to rethink my position as diasporic Minahasan, uh, as I previous, previously said that when I visit uh, Watu Pinawetengan, uh, and witness the stone ritual and participated in ancestral rituals. I knew uh, that the practice, uh, this practice, have been misunderstood as many as heresy, as an ancient practice that should not exist in modern world. Uh, and what makes them threatening to the Christian majority in North Sulawesi? which is one of the biggest Christian community in the vastly Islamic majority in Indonesia. This leads me to think that historical artifacts have been constructed by popular belief as taboo, which further marginalize the indigenous uh, people of the region. I try to develop uh, questions in dialogue and try to see different way of seeing the ritual, the relation between um, authorities that are control the reality by fabricating uh, the history and the resistance of the indigenous community. And I I don't think that this is a super speculating the future, but it's like more creating a dialogue. And um, I think um, I, I like to do like storytelling um, and there are lots of uh, poems and writings in my work. I and writings and poems helps, helps me to write some ideas that are hard to transcribe in a proper uh, textual form. It also happens to uh, in an image. In a way, uh, my practice are, are a medium for me to go pastiche, an instrument for me to appropriate anything that I find intriguing or I question. I mean, maybe, yes. Yeah, thank you. Oh, wow, very interesting because I also uh, was very fascinated that you connect everything with also like the modern theory of capitalism and also like the uh, notion of gender, uh, like mm -hmm. almost like criticizing, like re-questioning re what is the position of the female uh, when the Lumi mood, uh, give the birth to Goar, and then what is practiced in the in the reality when they are doing the ritual uh, today. Yeah, and I think uh, this is how we um, actually relate with our tradition. And tradition itself, traditional culture, actually it is not staying still like frozen object that remains like. Uh, hundred years ago, but it's something that is very open. It has the character of openness. It has the character of growth and developing and uh, accepting changes. And so, uh, part of probably I would, if, as an outsider, I would probably um, think also that wow, uh, Natasha's work would be you know, like uh, strengthen the tradition of Nahasa. Uh, probably this is a very provoking statement. And uh, I would like to open a Q&A uh, for everyone. I put uh, the floor to question, to discuss, to respond on uh, Natasha's presentations or ideas and works. 
uh, anyone would like to ask, please open. Yes. I have questions. Okay. Yes. Um, yeah, this, this has been really um, very stimulating um, sharing. Thank you, Natasha. So, um, yeah, I guess there has been uh, um, conflicting many layers about the Minahasa, Minahasan peoples or Minahasan culture. Um, in the context of the the, the Indonesian um, identities, particularly um, when we um, when we when we talk about or articulate about um, the Indonesian identities has been formed by thousands of islands. So particularly, I appreciate the knowledge that you have been sharing here about the indigenous um, um, existence and also how you have been learning from back to their traditions and rituals. And you have also talked about that um, in terms of your speculating um, practice of rehearsing and imagining the future in the context um, of the digital culture, this has been very um, interesting to me. Like, I, because I have also sense, well, please correct me if I, am incorrect. I have also sensed that the digital culture or tools, platforms, media of digital culture that you have been practicing and researching and using has become a sort of decolonial method. Am I right? Like how you how you look at the Japanese culture and then you look back to your family history or your collective history of memories or your personal history to Minahasan peoples. And how I, I, I really I'm really curious that how you how you perceive or how you think that the relationship between the Minahasan people and the digital representation, that how you how you conduct these digital tools as decolonial tools as well? I think um, in um, the contemporary uh, Minahasan uh, uh, culture is like part of the, the our just like uh, I said that uh, being a contemporary Minahasan is also being a contemporary uh, more, uh, human now. So, um, and the di digital, I, I found that uh, there are lots of uh, friends uh, working on uh, YouTube or um, presenting their uh, uh, rituals in the internet and it's it helps um, um, it helps uh, Minahasan also every people to uh, sharing uh, their message but um, but I see it's like more like a kinship uh, structure and um, uh, as uh, as an Indonesian, I see uh, there is a difference between uh, Mapalus and Gotong Royong, and also uh, ever since the pre-colonial period, uh, Minahasan people are trying to develop the scientific. Uh, uh, and technological apparatus to allow them to uh, reproduce uh, like uh, using the lunar calendar and uh, maybe in the past we have to see uh, the analog calendar but now we are using uh, the digital calendar and um, um what i 
fine about uh, uh, the current state of Mapalus uh, is like in WhatsApp group. It happens like uh, if someone's die and then you, the news are spread uh, on the internet. And what I said about uh, Mapalus is different from Gotong Royong uh, because they have a different fundamental practice. Uh, Mapalus can indeed uh, reductively uh, categorized by mutual aid. However, uh, as a philosophy of life, uh, it has origin uh, to a technological base of uh, Minahasa agricultural life uh, society and mechanism. Uh, therefore, uh, the feature of uh, Mapalus, Mapalusin is, I think is more complex than what Indonesia trying to construct uh, uh, with their umbrella term, uh, Gotong Royong. In this sense, Mapalus can also be understood as a group of people who are working together collectively uh, for some specific of labor, but um, there is also uh, Mapalus is not just a mutual aid, but, but it's also a, a technology to think uh, way uh, systematically uh, for solidarity. Very interesting. <laughs> what do you think, River? Because I think uh, the idea of Mapalus also like is like a um, web, right? Is it like more like a web that people from the connection between people and situation, uh, but not like what Gotong Royong is like e an event that is uh, created. Okay, let's work together in the spirit of uh, togetherness, but it's more like uh, organically fluid uh, rather than a uh, setup, right? Maybe that was the difference between the Mapalus and Gotong Royong. Gotong Royong is what? What? The Gotong Royong in English? I don't know. Mutual cooperation. Mutual cooperation. Mutual cooperation. Mutual <laughs> cooperation. Sorry. <laughs> we call it in, in Indonesia Gotong uh, Royong. It's very, for me, uh, since 2017, actually, not long time ago, since I was working for the Jakarta Biennale, I was thinking. Uh, what is important now for Asia? Since we are in the Asia context now, Asia Discovered Asia meeting, I was thinking um, the work of Natasha is very much related with the spirit of, I would say, um, the colonial, the colonialization, aesthetic of um, philosophy, um, of the way we are seeing us. And uh, it's, it's a big struggle, actually. And I think now in the area of Southeast Asia, especially in Asia generally, is, I don't know if I would say a trend or a drive or a wave, a wave actually, maybe better, to revisit our local resources, local knowledge. And the question is very dangerous, uh, the danger of the this approach is to represent what the local become like even more like an object of exotic to the West or for the others, or rather just, okay, it is what we have. And we are not uh, representing us like like a, the notion of tourism, uh, like, like, you know, like our, even our, uh, government is very much into the drive of promoting our culture and uh, but artists has the freedom actually to reinterpret to revisit to uh, 
to dig in and to unfail uh, our relationship with our resource. And in part, uh, I think that that uh, that's why I invite Natasha to offer a different perspective of uh, this approach, of her approach, uh, of an approach to to our local knowledge, local resource and culture. I would like to open for you to questions or respond. Anyone? Maybe uh, I I saw. Um, Susan, Susan Sandra. Hi, Susan. Are you still there? Yes, and I am. <laughs> yeah. You mentioned the word neutral is not applicable, but allow for another hybridity to become visible and sense through the collaging of the medium. Yeah. The Idea of no, it was just what it was just at the very end, Natasha, that you spoke of like creating a new neutral. But I think it's more powerful than that. I think it's it's that I think at this moment in time, neutral should not be applicable. That we should just get rid of that word almost and allow it to evolve to another idea. And this is in alignment with queer theory with feminism. And you are tapping into that without a without a doubt through your use of collage and rooted in um, the kind of um, historicity of the ritual, but finding your own kind of way of interpretation. Mm -hmm. so it's not it's not a negative. It's, it's definitely a compliment. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Does, does so that make sense? What do you think? Yeah, boleh, boleh. Yes. For anyone who wants to ask in bahasa Indonesia, siapa yang bisa uh, ingin bertanya dan atau merespon dengan bahasa Indonesia, saya coba untuk menerjemahkan juga anak saya juga ingin menerjemahkan. Since we have Indonesian audience here or participants here, I'm open also for them to question in bahasa Indonesia. And I try to translate, and Natasha will also like to translate. Budolo maybe can help. Who Carla Bianpun can help, maybe. <laughs> can, I, can I ask question, Melati? Yes, please. Thank you, thank you, Melati, for inviting me. This is a very rewarding gathering. Um, let me. Uh, my name is Dolorosa Sinaga. I'm an artist. I'm a sculptor but I'm also teaching at the Jakarta Art Institute. Um, 12 years ago, I opened a new class, Art Activism at JKJ. And um, I wanted to share with you that I met Natasha, uh, which I always call her Tante, because I, I love the level of calling it that Tante. It's very Indonesian. <laughs> but anyway, um, Seeing her work now, I was so astounding. It's very stunning ideas and presentation. And she is gone far away than I expected. I believe so. Um, <clears throat> from your presentation, um, now I have to call you Natasha. Right? Um, this is what I have in mind. You are um, full of curiosity in your um, family history plan or you know sociology of the uh, Minasan. Exactly the same like me. I'm from Batak. I'm also um, I'm also very full of you know like thinking about where I'm from and what is my or what is my family history is like. So, um, seeing your work, uh, you are going in a different way with me, um, which is totally different. But um, we have the same basis approach, like, you know, I believe that you see the spirit and me too, I see the spirit of my clan. But um, I was just 
wondering whether you have you have thought about you know having had all these experience in indigenous intellectuality and um, the the uh, all the paraphernalia of the cosmology which i think related to um, the value of how um, the kinship system is regulated or you know how um, the, the, the Nina Hassan would see um, the spirit as, uh, as the power that leads, leads all the people to a better life. Now, um, having born with all this um, sophisticated, you know, technology, like you are a virtual generation, right? You have all this, um, um, you have all this, what should I call it, knowledge of the uh, technicality and um, using everything that you need to use it to express what you want to say. But I, I was thinking, have you ever thought of having a platform like you know um, um, assertive in what you're experienced in your clan history and <clears throat> to do appropriation appropriate appropriasi appropriasi you have um, assertiveness of your um, culture, and there is an affirmation of your culture. But is there any platform of doing um, appropriation that connected connected to what you are now? seeing our condition today. So all that values probably um, for me is very much connected like what we now not having like the value that's been in our heritage in the past. Mm -hmm. um, well, this is it. I want to sit down. Natasha, do you have that platform in your in, in your mind to have another go in your work um, doing appropriation, appropriate, uh, appropriate, uh, appropriate, yes, something like that, and yeah, please. Jadi, what? Appropriasi budaya dalam karya. Appropriasi. But do you mean like appropriasi budaya di dalam karya, like appropriation? Yeah, dalam 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 konsep, konsep ah, yeah. that you can you can um, build uh, another value based on that value. That this new value is very much related to what you are now facing uh, mm -hmm. today. So if I, uh, there are uh, lots of understanding of uh, appropriation or appropriacy in my mind, but in this work, I appropriate uh, uh, the image and the story. But uh, what I am trying to do is how to question myself not to be um, very or how to be more critical rather than to be ethnocentric yeah. and um, what I maybe I'm I'm doing appropriation but I'm also doing a reconfiguration on uh, how um, people see women in Minahasa. So lots of people said 
also they are claim that uh, we are an equal uh, person like uh, women and women and uh, women and men are equal uh, we are very egalitarian but I didn't find it really like that in um, my uh, experience uh, so the appropriation and what uh, is maybe the uh, in the seventh and sixth during sixth and seventh century there's a um, power shift from uh, walian or feminine to tonaas is more masculine uh, and with colonial intervention uh, minahasan masculinity gain more power especially its glorification of wars and warriors as the result uh, there is always to'ar uh, and lumimu'ot rather than uh, acknowledging uh, the first person who was a woman and um, uh, as a result of the glorification of wars and warriors in the uh, after colonial uh, to'ar is relatively more well known and honored in in our traditions whilst karema and lumi mu'ut are considered as subordinate to to'ar uh, what i appropriate in my fictions i want to uh, invite uh, people to consider the reconfigurations and there are lots of uh, war theme uh, dance in uh, Minahasa but in my uh, work uh, all of the warriors are uh, the w women so maybe that's what I'm trying to appropriate and criticize yeah thank you okay great um there is a, uh, I just remember, I think Bukarla told me that uh, uh, one day that uh, Natasha is also part of the Xeno feminist uh, group. Uh, what, what is it called? Your group? Because I think there are different kind of Xeno feminism. And, uh, and, and so that, that, uh, that it deals with uh, technological material and um and the spirit of feminism in, in a different way in a new way in a language of knowledge and, and technology is that is that, is that uh, what are you now also um like uh, giving or sharing a spirit with other artists in the seno feminist uh, group maybe uh, yes but I'm not, uh, it, I'm inspired by uh, the Seno Feminist Manifesto, but trying to learn about it. But I believe uh, biology is uh, not a destiny. So, uh, and we are, we, we cannot choose, but we were born into a specific family or specific ethnic groups or uh, in a specific faith we we, we we can't choose but we we can choose our uh, gender hmm. very interesting um yeah I, I'm I I have a very little knowledge about Sino feminism that makes me more curious now to learn what what uh, uh, our colleagues out there uh, doing <laughs> and attempting. Maybe one day you can tell me more. And there is also in the chat uh, from Koi Koi, uh, he's or she. Uh, Hi Natasha, thank you for your work and my and presentation. My internet internet spirit is unstable. So he's actually uh, she or he. Koi Koi, maybe uh, they. They, they. Yeah. Anyway. Kwakwai is asking uh, about um, after you experience 
the rock worship rituals? Did you continue to apply the same ritualistic reference and practices to all other rocks in your path? Or were the power of the rocks in the communal rituals localized to that space and its co-inhabitants? Itu di chatnya ada ya, Natasha. As I learn more about the origins of sand, the island from the turning of rocks and ocean, I can relate the notion of rock as the source of life. I admit I'm asking this question because I'm also interested in appropriate protocol of dealing with rock spirits. So this is from Coco. Um, so maybe Anastasia can answer. Or um, so it's a very interesting uh, uh, question. Maybe I'm trying to um, translate this question into Bahasa Indonesia, and maybe some of of Mina Hasan friend share about this as well. Um, jadi ketika kamu uh, sudah melakukan uh, ritual dengan batu, apakah kamu uh, mengaplikasikan uh, ritualistik yang sama uh, dan mereferensikannya ke dalam kehidupanmu uh, dan batu-batu uh, lain dalam hidupmu? Um, perhaps from my uh, perspective is I it's a very difficult to uh, answer but it's very interesting I after the ritual uh, the stones I I used to I used to like like crystal healings or something very new age uh, that we have uh, in our days uh, but then um, I, I saw uh, uh, people in Minahasa uh, um, they were um, they are not just like uh, praying for the stones, but they are uh, um, they um, with I well, while I'm engaging with Minahasa and Cosmology, uh, the existence of stone Minahasa is not only for the sake of human uh, extraction. Uh, or as materials used by humans to develop technology, but it's a uh, an object that gives life itself. Uh, stone gives place for moss, moss to exist, and uh, moss gives nutrition to other beings, which eventually leads to human existence. This chain reaction is important in uh, Minahasan cosmology, uh, which is also evident in the story of cosmogony of Minahasa. And I'm, I, um, feeling like uh, when I was in ritual, uh, some of friends are. Uh, giving a smoke to us their stones and then i have a st stone uh, necklace a oh, bracelet sorry um i said that can you pray for this and i was good and friends from there were like uh, no that is not the right way uh, but then if you believe to oppo then you have to uh, uh, not to give the food for your uh, stone, but for your uh, soul and brain. And um, yeah, and one of the 
interesting uh, experience that I encountered was I I went to um, Watutiwa for the f uh, first time. I, I think I went with Freddy and Tonas Andre. And uh, Tonas Andres uh, instructed me to um, to pray. I don't know how to pray actually. I know doa bapa kami, tapi I I don't know how to uh, pray in a proper way. <laughs> and I then he was instructed me to. Bagoso ding ba ding batu, and I saw blood. Goso ding batu, it's like um, scratching your arms to the stones, and I saw I saw blood, and there is uh, I think what there is no protocol. What do you mean you saw blood? Like if visionary or is real blood from your scratch or like uh, like you enter another world and I, yeah maybe uh, another world like it's my uh, the, um, collective memory perhaps if I'm not and um, while or, I'm scratching myself I'm I was uh, closing my eyes and I saw blood. It's it was like, wow, that's very intense. And um, uh, Tona as Andre and Tona as Freddy said maybe it's the um, co collective uh, memories because uh, there was. Uh, war uh, in the past times and yeah maybe maybe uh, mungkin Tonas Andre mau cerita sedikit tentang protokol uh, dengan menghadapi batu ya bagaimana kampusnya jadi, um, jadi ada yang tanya nih, eh, gimana? Eh, ada yang penasaran bagaimana eh, protokol untuk eh, dealing atau menghadapi eh, spirit dari batu? Menghadapi roh dari roh dari batu. <tuh> jadi untuk kepercayaan Minahasa sendiri eh, apa yang ada di alam ini semuanya hidup karena itu diletakkan oleh maha kuasa jadi untuk batu ini eh, menurut kepercayaan Minahasa sendiri dia hidup dia hidup jadi eh, kelebihan batu adalah abadi jadi coretan-coretan masa dulu yang dicoret di batu itu menjadi uh, satu pengetahuan untuk generasi sekarang ini. Jelas uh, coretan masa dulu itu mempunyai histori yang cerita. Jadi uh, roh yang ada di dalam batu itu adalah ingatan-ingatan uh, masa lampau. Dengan sisi spiritual orang Minahasa, mereka mampu uh, mengembalikan mengembalikan itu uh, ingatan masa lampau itu di masa kini. Jadi uh, di saat orang yang belum terbiasa akan hal seperti itu pasti kaget sama hmm. dengan penjelasan Natasha tadi melihat darah. Boleh saya terjemahkan dulu? Oh iya. Ya. Ya, nanti saya ketinggalan <laughs> bisa terjemahin so, uh, atau naas itu apa ya maksudnya fungsinya seperti shaman atau pemimpin upacara atau yang dituakan atau gimana uh, 
kata chef dan mungkin kita bisa menjelaskan sedikit ini ya. uh, kalau naas uh, means uh, smart people or intellectual it could be uh, religious leaders or ritual leaders or uh, people that are like professor okay so but it would be in, yeah mm-hmm. terima so, kasih Sandre, uh, so I'm going to translate. So according to the Minahasan belief, the stone has the spirit. The stone has the power of spirit that can recall uh, memory of the past of the people. So that, pertanya uh, singkatnya begitu ya, Natasha. Yeah, yeah. And that's why uh, for the people who have. No, no experience yet with uh, connecting with the stone and sometimes they experience a very new experience that um, their memory from the past appeared uh, mm-hmm. and being reconnected again so that's uh, um, that's amazing kemudian boleh lanjut Pak Tona Asandre Tona As atau Hey Wawar mungkin mau menambahkan. Jadi ada. Halo. Halo. Selamat, Selamat bertemu. Hello everyone. Uh, I think I try to uh, answer the question about how the Minahasan people. Uh, see the stone. Uh, there is an old poetry that I ever learned that tell this Raja uh, si watu empat tak neon taan si makawatu. It's meaning uh, it's not the stone that we try to remind or to uh, worship. But who create the stone? Sometimes in Minahasan we not call directly God. Uh, there is a uh, symbol because it's sometimes uh, taboo to directly point to God. Uh, so uh, as a Minahasan people, we we try to connect. The creator is like an emotional recall in acting. I use that uh, analog uh, because sometimes uh, when we read something, uh, we try to understand who is right the text and what is the mind behind the words. I think it's something like that. But that's for me. Maybe the other person in Minahasa have a different point of view. But uh, in my understanding, it's something like that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's it. Terima <laughs> kasih. Wow. Thank you. So that when people are uh, visiting the stone, that means actually to is normally they they are ready to receive something that. Also, probably unknown, like memory of the past, because sometimes I, I forgot what I have seen when I was a child. Uh, that probably still remain in my somewhere in my memory container. And uh, when I come to touch the stone, and probably then it will appear for the first time in my life. Then, for example, like. Natasha has experience to see blood, something like that, Mas Freddy. Oh, Mas, don't ask Freddy. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, may, uh, well, maybe something like that because um, in the tradition of Minasan, uh, Lumalus, as uh, Natasha point before, is meaning to walk in the path of the ancients. So uh, we believe that in ours there is the 
the soul of the ancients. So we can track back to that uh, what is called a uh, uh, spirit or roh or a uh, soul mm. or the pure soul, something like that. Yeah. Of course, uh, when yeah. we we attend a sacred place, it's not just to play a game, but we going in there to have something to learn because uh, that is actually the meaning of uh, walking at the path of the ancients or Lumalus. Mm. Something like the, uh, Natasha uh, try to close. Mm -hmm. And actually, I agree. This is kind of, uh, you know, inspiring um, notions that I often uh, experience and meet something new again from the, the ancient practice uh, from the traditional rituals that uh, most of the ritual, traditional ritual, is very close to give us function. It's functioning. It's not just, a, how do you say, like um, artistic setup for ceremony and and not busy with, with the whole setup, but it's more contently um, uh, done, you know, like it's, it's, I cannot express, jadi gimana ya, bicara, bicara, ini aku jadi blank, uh, maksud aku gini, uh, I, I mean, like, tradition has a function, so if yeah. the contemporary art, yeah, the contemporary ini ya, uh, yeah. uh, like, uh, like the work of Natasha, uh, if it relates with the function of the, of the meaning of the, the functional meaning of the ritual, the Mapalus, for example, now I think I think it, it's amazing how we still connect to a digital image, digital Im moving image and information, and then we come to this awareness that it is functioning, it is functioning. To touch the stone, still the information is very raw. It, we touch the stone and we yeah. recall our memory that is forgotten, and that is a, a kind of a, a healing function of a ritual that we often um, encounter in, in many different kind of ritual and cultural related rituals uh, in our uh, different kind of traditions. And and that's the amazing part. Uh, that the work is connected and uh, uh, it doesn't matter what kind of form because the tradition itself is open, I think. The openness of the tradition is very, um, very how you say, uh, serving our life. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, what I... I found also interesting when I see blood, uh, I, I was thinking subconsciously, did I see real blood or did I imagine? Because what, I've, uh, what I'm referencing, what, in what I uh, experience is I, I remember the film uh, The Shining. Oh. There's a horror film uh, by Stanley Kubrick. Yes. Uh, so that. there's a yeah. scene where uh, an elevator um, opens and then there was suddenly a flood of massive blood. I'm, question, um, I'm referencing to that idea. What I remember for the first time is well, I I remember the the Shining film, but it's happened in a very ancient site. So mm. it's interesting how memories work in a very different and a very various way, mm. because uh, it's blood. It's a memory collective. It's related to ancient culture, but I'm referencing to uh, a popular culture. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. River. 
We are actually approaching to our two hour session, but I think can I extend to some minutes more because I would yes, like of to. Of course, please. Decide, if you don't mind, uh, if 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 anyone want to leave, um, um, it's also okay because our schedule is only for two hours. But I will not extend too long because I would like to give an up. Um, I would like to listen what. Uh, uh, Keith Miller is uh, a friend of my father, an anthropologist archaeologist uh, uh, from UK, and uh, he also uh, practiced some rituals with stone. Very interested with uh, relationship between the, the archaeological, uh, uh, what is it? I would say objects, artifacts, yeah. and. Uh, new way of, of, of ritual in, in, in its relations. Please, uh, Keith? Yeah, thank you, thank you. Yes, I'm, I'm in the UK and I worked for many years as, um, as an archaeologist and I just uh, was listening to Natasha and the question about whether the stones have whether the stones themselves have a, a being or have a presence. And just to say that for many, many years, like maybe 20 years, reg we, I and uh, others who, who were not archaeologists, but uh, were students of uh, Suryodamo Suprapto and his movement art and learn with him the the art of, uh, you know, uh, movement ritual art. And so we worked for regularly, maybe for 20 years in stone circles like Stonehenge and a place called Avebury. Now these are five and a half thousand years old. So the people that built these stones, their stories yeah, you could say they're completely lost. We don't even know the language. We have some understanding of their society through archaeology. But for understanding the spirit or the meaning of the stones, it's like what we say in English, an open book. We, we don't really know but they have a very strong presence. Now, as an archeologist, I can understand them through archeological technique and um, technology, history of technology. And yeah, you could say scientific understanding, but this is not enough to understand what it is like to be in the stones, developing ritual and performance and dancing, you know, um, ritual art is what Suprapto called it, which is a, a, a good, uh, it's a useful word. So the approach there is more, not, not science, but is more art and using art and using the stone as a kind of, you could say portal, doorway, window for connection with the past, f with the ancestor. Um, and also because it is stone and it is in the ground, a megalithic stone, then it has a strong presence and it also speaks very strongly of the environment. So is rather like you were saying, Natasha, is there is human human, there is human stone relationship, there is human nature. And in order, and there is human stone God that Freddie was talking about. So for us, we can never know the stories of the people who built the stone circles. 
I mean, maybe in a maybe a shaman might make contact with the spirits, but but let's say we don't really know, but we can honor them and we can learn a lot from them because of their fantastic age, five and a half thousand years ago, but also they can speak to us of the environment and what it means to change the environment, to build these things, technology and the human nature balance. Mm -hmm. Thank you. But we need, yeah, but we need art and science together. Mm -hmm. Definitely. <laughs> yeah. Also, some people or many people believe that art is also a science, can be also scientists. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I think so. Yeah, probably. Um, yeah, there is another question that uh, the people, uh, that I I think uh, we need to listen to Natasha respond to questions, which is from Ines. That uh, uh, thank you, Natasha, for your inspiring presentation. I'm curious to know if you identify with the digital language as a tool of your expression for this time being, or is it also because you feel comfortable and maybe closer to the digital language? Uh, as it is closer, closer to your generation expression. Um, he even also text me on the WhatsApp, uh, maybe shortly to ask, it, are you using technology as a tool or is technology already an extension of yourself? So I much think so that it influences how you see, you perceive. So that, that's her extended question. I think what we understand as technology, maybe the laptop or computers or iPhone is technology. But then I realized that uh, technology is also extended uh, of our body. It's an uh, Technology is not just uh, gadgets, but uh, for example, calling the, uh, making the rituals, uh, contacting with the uh, ancestor is also called technology because we are not merely um, calling the ancestors or, or praying, but we are using a uh, other technos uh, like calendars or a uh, time uh, knowledge uh, as a tool to um, to work to do the labor and um, uh, I am uh, I know I mostly work with a, a digital language. But I'm, I'm, I myself, I am also questioning about the uh, digital the manner, uh, digital persona, and um, uh, what is the difference between virtual reality and the um, the reality? Are we in the same uh, platform if we are? in digital or if we are in daily life. Yeah. So it That's does it fucking up my mind. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Um, very inspiring. It's like also like my daughter, she is 23 years old and I'm always curious to know how she thinks and Oh, you, you, you hear the fireworks <laughs> because it's Ramadan. Uh, so the uh, how she sees the world from uh, very much uh, dig digital influence, uh, digital culture influence in, in her life, in her generation. 
a very curious how she sees and it is slightly different and uh, than I see and I'm I'm very surprised um, that, uh, that that it is different so then since then I followed uh, like a younger generation there the work of uh, also uh, other artists that use the digital language is totally different than, the, for example, my generation did a lot of uh, uh, experimental films. And uh, although the history is coming from there and like into this uh, form, form of uh, digital language, but, uh, you know, like your work is so much uh, occupied with the digital technology. And I think, um, Especially, you know, like animation language is, is like something that beyond my capacity. <laughs> but, but I think it's always inspiring for, for, for people who are interested, of course, uh, into digital language. I think uh, we come to our end. And and uh, thank you very much for today's uh, fulfilling sessions with Natasha Tonte. Thank you to everyone uh, who have been attending since over two hours now. And uh, thank you for questioning and discussing. And um, probably we will carry uh, these inspirations and uh, new knowledge or informations uh, to our further uh, steps and for the way and um, yeah I would like to remind you that tomorrow will be the third day and we are going to speak about ghosts and spirits and also the process of uh, creation by Korakrit uh, Aruna Non Chai from Bangkok uh, also um, Visual art and performance artist, a younger college of mine. And I would like to wish you to attend. If you have not registered, please register now and see you tomorrow. I would like to give, I would like to thank you to Natasha, of course. Natasha, thank you so much. I've been enjoying this. And uh, thank you to Tonas Freddy and Tonas, Andre. Andre. Thank yeah, you for gangguan jaringan tadi. Ya. Yeah. Oke. Okay. Terima kasih, terima kasih banyak and I would like to give back to River to close officially our session today. Terima kasih, terima kasih. Thank terima you. Terima kasih. <laughs> Thank you people for this evening's um this afternoon or evening's beautiful sharings and that has been really inspiring and stimulating about the how the indigenous um heritage and um, richness can you know can can be a really uh important treasure from uh, for us to learn how we can go back to the ritual and this is has been really fascinating in relation to taiwanese context that we have been also have learning from the indigenous ancestors or knowledges and cultural practices of contemporary art and this has been really wonderful sharing from from you and for us to learn like this indonesian related um historical um understanding and knowledge thank you everybody for staying with us until now and hope to see you soon tomorrow and please feel free to spread the word to your friends if they haven't registered for other programs of the Adam Amla this week please do we will be um learning a lot from Melati's program with their with her friends and this amazing lineup of artists thank you everybody Thank you. Thank have you. Have a good day or have a good evening. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye, everyone. Bye-bye.